So welcome to Childhood Roots of Adult Happiness. Um, it's led by Rabbi Frank, and it's part of the Prostown Center. Um, Pesach at Prostown Online offerings, and I just want to thank Rabbi Frank for um, sharing and being part of this and, and um, during these times. And we'd like to hand it off to Aaron. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, thank you for joining. It's a nice small crowd. <laughs> it, um, I, you know, I was thinking this morning, how do we even begin? Um, and uh, I mean, I'm used to to walking across the beautiful fields of Pearlstone and uh, going to teach some Torah and learning with Psachia and Michael. Judy, I'm Aaron Frank. I don't know if we've, uh, we've met live before. I can't hear you, but I can unmute you. I'm gonna unmute you, Judy. We might have met at Pearlstone. Okay, wonderful, great. I'm looking forward to doing some learning together in this environment. And one of my oldest and dearest people in my life is here on, uh, looks like an audio uh, from Israel, David Fine. So uh, good to see you, Reb David. Thank you for coming. I don't know if he's even on, on, uh, on, his, on his microphone. Um, okay, you know what? I, I think that one of the things that I've been um, thinking about in the last few months is that um, I think all of us uh, find comfort in uh, find even more comfort in the things that we always take comfort in during these times. Um, I have to confess that one of my, uh, my vices is uh, following baseball and sports, and um, that vice has been fully taken away. Um, may not be the most constructive vice in the world, but uh, you know, it keeps me, uh, it, it's, it's a nice diversion. Um, but the most holy, um, source of comfort for me outside of my family um, is learning Torah. And I have found that um, of all the things during this time, um, hello, David, of all, hello. The things, of all the things during this time, um, the regularity of being um, kovea itim la Torah, of setting time for learning has been um, the piece that um, continues to ground me. And so um, I, I, I thank Sakya and Pearlstone for, for giving us this forum, even though it's not where we all ultimately really would like to be right now. Um, it's the next, best, the next best thing, and we'll, uh, we'll do some learning together. Um, so, okay, with that, um, I wanted to share with you uh, a, a book that I, I actually, I think over winter break, I was cleaning out my study and um, I, uh, I came across um, a book that I honestly have no idea how I even got it. Um, it's called The Childhood Roots of Adult Happiness. And um, I picked this up. Um, my aunt, who, uh, has, who is in many ways a mentor to me, she was a head of school uh, many, many years ago. She's cleaning out a lot of her books. So I have a feeling that maybe she, uh, she, got, she gave us this book. And I started reading it. It's called The Childhood Roots of Adult Happiness, Five Steps to Help Create, to Help Kids Create and Sustain Lifelong Joy. And I started reading the book. And as I was reading the book, I realized there's so much that he says that um, is also reflected in Torah. And so uh, I thought we would learn together three of his five steps, um, five steps of uh, toward adult happiness, and three of these elements. And learn a little bit of, uh, of Torah that could be reflected in it as well. Um, but I actually wanted to start with the dedication. I'm going to actually share my screen so we can all follow this together. So I can see you on the left. For those of you, I'm assuming a lot of you have, have been on a few Zoom calls in the last month. Is that a safe assumption? Yes. Okay. I'm going to unmute everybody because there's so few of us that we can, it's not gonna be that hard. Okay, Judy, you're the only one. I, Judy, where, where do you live, Judy? I live in Washington, Virginia. And you might remember my daughter, Sarah Shalva, who you- Oh to yeah, of course. Right, so that's why I was at Pearlstone for the past couple of Sahim and 
Shavuot, and I don't know when all else you were there. Right. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Now we're all good. sheltering in place. It's a whole different thing. How is Sarah and the family? Great. We did. <laughs> we did <laughs> Seder's this year. <laughs> okay. So uh, we were all together as a family, and Great. so that was very lovely. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. I'm going to start with the dedication of the book. Um, and, you know, I, when I read this, I, I was telling Psaki, when I came up with this title, it was, uh, I feel like it was a different era. It seems like it was 100 years ago. Um, but actually, we can all dream. I think I, when, I, when I decided and I started the, the dedication, it was winter. And I said, you know what? Let's dedicate our learning um, to summer. Uh, and uh, we can all dream that summer might come again. Okay. But before we do that, I just want to um, say that before we learn together, let's um, make our learning for the schut of those who are really struggling with this horrible disease and with the hopes that um, they go from darkness to light and our learning should be in their, in their merit. Okay, um, let's do some learning here. Um, so, Michael, are you up for some reading, maybe? Oh, sure. Awesome. Great. David, don't worry. We'll put you to work. Uh, okay, from the go dedication. Ahead. Dedication. Uh, all right, school is out. It's June, and the backyard beckons. I, have always, I, ha I always have high hopes for the summer. Summer is like childhood. It passes too fast. But if you're lucky, it gives you warm memories from which you take strength in the cold days ahead. Summer is also like childhood in that you may not think what you are doing matters very much while you are doing it. But later on, you realize it mattered far more than you knew. Summer is hot days, picnics, roads under repair, and the cans to swim. Summer is slower than the rest of the year, and its days are longer than any others. Summer embraces children. But like childhood, summer also warns. Warms, love me now, I will not last. Like a child, summer teaches us to, about the best in life. Summer asks us to do what we should help our children do. Play, relax, explore, and grow. I dedicate this book to summer and to all the children who play beneath its sun. I got to tell you, Michael, I... I, I... I, I read this this morning to prepare and hearing someone else read it, I'm like almost brought to tears because I feel like we're so far away from, from feeling like that. But um, we'll, we'll dream for this 45 minutes or so. Right. Um, so in the hopes that we have a summer, you know, my friend is, I, I live a block away from the uh, director of Camp Ramon and the Berkshires and who knows what their summer is going right. to be. But we'll go, we'll go with this. So what he does, what, what Hallowell does in this, um, in, this, in this piece, in this book, is he takes these elements of summer and he, he focuses on each one as important building blocks for, um, for, happy, for adult happiness. And so he, what he's going to do is he's going to look at these ideas, play, relax, explore, and grow. And those are all the things that so much of us know that kids do. Um, and um, we sometimes don't really realize how important they are, um, but they are the seeds that lead to um, important elements of, a, of adult life. Um, so he dedicates it to summer. And let's hope that with that, maybe we'll all see each other this summer, either at Pearlstone in Israel or who knows. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the three elements, okay? We're going to look at the element of play and the element of what's going to be called, what we're going to call connectedness and the element of optimism. Those are the three elements that we're going to look at as very, very important elements to childhood that leads to adult happiness. So we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to first look at Hallowell's approach to these and why they're so important. And then we're gonna learn a little bit of Torah um, that reflects each one of them. Um, Judy, are you up for reading or are you more sure. wanting to listen? Sure. Okay, you can shoot. By the way, I don't know about you, but I've become, I've on, I'm on Zoom so much that sometimes I wanna put my whole body into the Zoom 
and I want to read and I want everyone to see me. And then there are times in which I frankly just want to listen to the Zoom and go for a walk. So wherever you are, that's fine. Okay. So if you want to read, go for it, Judy. Okay. By play, I mean any activity in which there is room for spontaneous invention and or change. The child who plays early continues to play. And with some luck as an adult, he or she will find a kind of play that people are willing to pay him or her to do. <laughs> Adults who can't play are in trouble, not only in their pursuit of happiness, but their pursuit of excellence as well. I'm going to read Froebel and then we'll talk. Absolutely. Froebel adds, play is the highest expression of human development in childhood, for it alone is the free expression of what is in the child's soul. Okay. So, Judy, how do you, how, how can we define play here? What do you think that, how do you think, what do you think of Hallowell's definition of play? Well, I, I rather think that, you know, that, that, Play, um, the essence of play here is spontaneous. You know, in the, in the measured, uh, you know, we're all coming off of like Freud's work and love um, as essence of human being. And Hallowell is, is focusing on play as a part of that, um, of the spontaneity in life. He's mm -hmm. adding to the differentiation from systematic and required and dedicated to anything that just emerges from the soul and carries forth um, in interaction. Interesting, so <laughs> almost in like contrast to structure. Absolutely. Right? There's structure and then there's, there's play. And he, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the rabbinic language, it might be, and I could put this in the next, I didn't put this in the sources, but it's interesting now that you're saying this, there's this idea of keva and kavana, right? You, you want to explain that difference a little bit? I hate to put you on the spot, but the difference between keva and kavana, or somebody want to share? Sure. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, that was coming up for me when I was hearing the description is, especially in the connection to summer, is that the first, well, sort of spring, really, the beginning of the summer, if you split the rainy season and the dry season, the first month of the dry season is, is Pesach, which is Nisan, which is the, this, this moon. And it is, it's the month of Judah. And that's the month of like, not so much uh, Keva, but more Kavana, more like the inspired spirit of like growing. It's like a child, it's like the beginning stuff. And then Joseph, Yosef is always, uh, is, he's the one who's the designer. He's the one who's like uh, about Keva, about, about structure, about design, about a proper Kalim for things. So that was, that's what was coming up for me. And that sort of the balance between the, the spirit of Judah and the spirit of Joseph as like a constant balance um, was Great. resonating. Nice. Okay. So this idea of play in some way is this is sort of like following our heart following our um our our passions in moving out of the structure that other people that other people give to us um but you know play often sort of gets a bad rap but i've always um i i i was thinking about um the word for toy and the word for amusement okay so the word for toy in Hebrew is tsa'atsua or tsa'atsuim are toys mm -hmm. in Hebrew, right? Okay. And um, amusement or entertainment is, um, is very, very similar to it. My guess, I didn't uh, search this in the, uh, in the uh, Academia La Hakdamata La Shon, but my guess is they took the modern word they created the modern word sa'atsua from the word sha'ashua, which, or sha'ashuai, which means amusement or entertainment or plaything, um, which uh, has its roots, at least from what I know, the first place that it has its roots is in Tehillim, in Psalms, 
where uh, there's, a, there's a famous uh, Rabbi Shlomo tune to this. Lulei Torat Chashashuai Az Avadati Be'oni. Right? Were, your, were not your teaching, your Torah, my amusement or game or delight? I, I, there are a lot of ways you can translate Shashuai, but that, definitely this idea of play is what came to my mind. I would have perished in my affliction. Right? So it's Louis. And what is the Louis? Or the Valel? Once, once again? What's the translation to Bilui as in Bilui Mishpachti or Livalel? Livalot is to spend time. Livalot. Bilui Zman is to spend time with other people. Yeah. Livalot. So here he's saying if the Torah, and it's, I'm thinking of what Psachi was saying, if the Torah we're not, um, we're, we're only Keva, we're only this Yosef, right? If it were only Torah, but it wasn't Shashuai, if it wasn't something that I got delight in, something that I got amusement or entertainment in, you know, Azavadati I, Boni, I wouldn't have, uh, I, I, I couldn't survive. And, um, you know, I'm thinking more about what I said at the beginning of this conversation, of, um, you know, I, I think that that's a great pasuk for today even, right? If we didn't have Torah, if we didn't have community, if we didn't have Pesach to keep us going, right? We would perish in our affliction. David, any thoughts on that that jumped out? I just had to step out for a second. I just got back. It's okay. Sorry. You don't have to. All right. But, so this idea of Lulei Torah Chashashuai. It's very important to look at Torah and our relationship with God in this growth, in this play type of mindset. And it's not, it's not, it's not a degrading way of looking at it. It's very, very important. Let's look at the Pachad Yitzchak here, Rabbi Yitzchak Hutner, who talks about um, the idea of a pe'ula shel sha'ashuim, an action of amusement. Okay, um, anybody want to read the Hebrew and English? Michael, you want to give it a shot? Oh, yeah. Ma hu ha'evdel ben peulah shel shashuim l'shayach minei ha'peulot sheno memalalim bahem et... Can't see from here. Olmenu? Olamenu. Olamen, Olamenu. Let me turn this to the side so I can actually see a figure. I'm doing this on my phone. It's okay. Uh, I, always, I never do good with the um, abbreviation. Okay, let's just, can you read, can you just go up to, um, to, uh, right, can you, do the translation up to where yeah, I'm what highlighting. Is the difference, what is the difference between a play or amusement act and the rest of the acts with which we fill our world? A play or amusement act excels in the purpose, which is not outside, but is found and lies within it. Good. That is huge. Okay. So he's trying to say, what is what is this act of play? It's something that is... It's not to lead to something else. I, the thing that I keep thinking about when I read this Pachy Yitzchak, which I love, is that it's, a, it's almost like Torah Lishma, right? I always think about if you have a, a four-year-old or a five-year-old who's playing with blocks or playing with Lego, and you go and you ask them, why are you playing with Lego? I always feel like their response would be, what do you mean, why am I playing with Lego? right? I'm playing with Lego because I'm playing with Lego. But if I, but when we as adults look at kids who play with Lego, we're like, oh, you know, he could be an engineer or he could be an architect. Like we're always worried about that next, what it's leading toward. But what he's saying, he says, kim tmuna v'chavuya betocha pnima. It's actually, it's, the, the purpose is just in what it is. 
And then he says, I'll, I'll pick it up from here, Michael, because I know it's, it's hard to see. Stam pe'ula bechavenet el anifal mimena ve'al yada. Ve'ilu bepe'ula shel mishak. Lo hadavar anifal kim hape'ula be'atzma. Hi hi ha'mishak. Lachain, ain anu omrim ki ha'tinok um, oved o osek ki ha'tinok mishta'ashea o mishachek. That's why we don't say children work, because if you work, you're doing it for some sort of like, I don't know, purpose or some end game. He said, but the baby amuses or plays. It's just something that is important to do in itself. And in itself is the joy. And I was thinking about the Seder, and then we'll, I'll, I'll open it up to some, some questions or comments. Um, I was reading um, Rabbi Avi Weiss, gave, uh, I, didn't, I didn't quote him on this. I will, this is one of the beauties of Zoom. I wouldn't have been able to do this. Um, he, he did a, um, a commentary on the Haggadah for the coronavirus times. So he said, Chad Gadya, the opening words of this last song of the Seder may be a play on the word Agadita. Life is like an Agad, life is an Agadic tale that is hard to understand, but just like we sing playfully the story of Chagadya, Often, too, in the direst of circumstances, we must remember to laugh. And the memes, videos, and jokes that are going around can serve to balm our emotions at this tragic time. So this idea of play does two things. I would say, according to Rav Hutner, it could be something that's an act that's just important within itself. And just like when you learn Torah Lishma just for learning, so too, play is very, very important because um, I think that, that play for a child, um, they do it just for its own sake. And that's a very, very important root of adult happiness. And I think at the Seder with Chad Gadya or Manishtana or any of these sort of um, things that seem kitschy, they, play, they, um, they tap into this idea of play um, in a very, very, um, in a very, very deep way, because the play is important, and you have to look at Torah and our Avodat Hashem sometimes in a in a playful or more kavana kind of way, um, and that's very, very important. So that's root number one. We're gonna we're, we're looking at this idea of play. Hallowell sees play as a very important element in, in adult happiness, and I think that we also should look at play as an important element in our Avodat Hashem. Thoughts, questions, ideas? I'll unmute everybody in case there's any thoughts. Okay. Forward? Forward. Forward, Forward. okay. The next element we're gonna look at is connectedness. Um, okay. This is a very interesting study that Hallowell quotes. Um, we don't have a lot of people, so uh, we don't have a lot of... Anyone want to volunteer to read this next part? While um, hard bigger. work is an important element to success... I'm going to make uh, it bigger, so I, we have a request to make it bigger. Boom. Better? Yeah, yeah, let me turn it sideways so I can see it now. Okay. I can see it now. Um, while, Hallowell, while hard work is an important element to success, Hallowell and his colleague Michael Diamanti, in a study done at the Exeter Prep School, found that the that drivenness was not most critical. Drivenness. Hallowell, drivenness. Drivenness. Right. Drivenness was not most. Sorry, was not most critical. Hallowell writes, "We measured drivenness, and ironically, the students who were the highest on the driven scale got poorer grades. We measured connectedness." by responses to questions along the lines of, do you feel, feel closely connected to members of your family? And do you feel that you are part of something larger than yourself? The students that answered yes to those types of questions were the students who got the highest grades. That, to me, I, that is like such an amazing study, okay? At Exeter, which is like the fancy, the, the prototypical fancy, fancy prep school, what do you think, Judy? Thoughts? I'm thinking, well, I'm a researcher by profession. Oh, all right. So, so I'm sorry. Can anything to, by you. Go ahead. Right. I'm sorry to beg difference, but I don't know that there was any measure of students before this test was given. 
it might be that the students who are the happiest are the ones who didn't have to struggle so hard in getting whatever that material was. So I challenge his conclusions on the basis of, of, uh, of the time difference and the start measures of both those groups or individuals as the case may be. All right, all would, fine, Judy, I'll let you, you know, this is actually something funny. I gave, um, I, I cited this study in a lecture that I gave um, a few weeks ago, or maybe it was about a month ago, I cited this study and someone came up to me and they said, I know at Ned Hallowell and I'm gonna put you in touch with him. And I actually got in touch with him. So after I get in touch with him, I'll put you in touch with him, Judy. Okay. And you can, I'm not a researcher, but I'll- we'll argue it out. Exactly. Right. Well, I would also, I would also take um, um, issue with another thing is the question is also not necessarily how much, how well, how are they connected with members of your family? It's also how well are you connected with other of your classmates um, uh, in the school? Because one of the things that I'm noticing now uh, that mm -hmm. when you're not in school, having someone who's in fifth grade and you're giving all of these assignments and you're necessarily working on your own as opposed to being able to share a lot of your thoughts Very with your classmates. Uh -huh. um, that you're not going to necessarily, that the lack of social interaction at school, which really cannot be um, replicated at home, does definitely have an effect. Interesting, that's fa I didn't even think about this, it's so true. That's right, you know, this idea of connectedness is what a lot of people succeed because they feel connected. Well, Absolutely. I mean, I'll go one step further. In some ways, I could say that the amount of work that my son is getting at your alma mater right now is more than what he was receiving um, when he was at school, or maybe it's showing that way because he's not doing a lot of the work at school. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, it's very interesting how that plays out and you know there's going to be there are going to be studies upon studies about how kids are learning in zoom and and the interesting thing to me is when people ask me how have how has it been i say there's such a wide spectrum you have kids who do much worse on zoom you have kids who frankly do better on zoom and then you have everybody in between and the same with parents I have some parents who love it. I have some parents who are ready to jump off the roof about it. And, um, and, I, and same with teachers. So this has made it so sitting in this chair over the last six weeks has been very, very challenging because um, everybody is reacting very, very differently. But this idea of connectedness is, uh, is a very, very interesting question. Um, I, to me, I thought of, um, of a famous Mishnah from Pirkei but I'll read it quickly, because I do want to get to two other elements in the 20 or 25 minutes we have left. So um, it's sort of about what community you choose to be in. So uh, this is a great Mishnah of Pirkei Avot, and I actually have, I, I, I taught this Mishnah many times to teenagers when talking to them about what kinds of friends they want to surround themselves with. So um, it says the following, um, I'm a Rabbi Yossi Ben Kisma, so I was walking on the way. Someone came to, to me. Um, he said to me, hello. And I said back to him, hello. Where are you from? Amarti, well, I said to him, I'm from a big town of sages and scribes. Amarli, Rabbi. You want to come and move to our place? I'll give you gold and stone and pearls. Come and move to my town, right? And I think that, uh, you know, a lot of, I, I mean, uh, I see my friend David Fine on the line, like a lot, of, a lot of rabbis move out of town and a lot of rabbis like to stay in town. Right, and that's a little bit of a part of it, right? My grandfather, Elva Shalom, was the rabbi in Norfolk, Virginia for 37 years. Right, he was, he, and he did, and, and there's a positive to being out of town and in town, but basically this is someone comes up to someone who lives in town, wherever your in town is, and he says, come and move 
where, where there isn't as much. Amar Tilo, Bini, Imatano Tenli, Kol Kesef Vizahab, Abanim Tomo, and Margaliot Sheba Olam. If you give me everything, any dar elab makom Torah, I'm not going to live anywhere. I will only live in a place of Torah. Below Od, Ela Shabisha Apatir at Tosha, Adam, Emil Avim Lo Ladam, Lo Kesef Lo Zahab, Lo Abanim Tomo, and Margaliot. Says it doesn't matter because when I die, I can't take any of it with me. Ela Torah, Masim Tavim Bilbad. Lachain, the Sefer Tilim, Ayyade Davin Melech Yisrael, Tovli To, excuse me, Torah Picha Melpe Zahava Kesef. As it says in Tehillim, it's better to have a thousand pieces of, uh, it, is, it is better to have Torah than a thousand pieces of gold and silver. So this idea, okay, and this is interesting, Michael, because I'm thinking about connectedness on Zoom now, an, an element we never thought of, right? Like, who are you connecting to? And a lot of people are sitting in their homes and we have, at the touch of a button, we can decide what kind of community we want to connect to, right? We can either be a Zoom bomber, which is these people who are going into these Zoom rooms and, you know, being totally inappropriate, or my parents, Baruch Hashem, I think my, my mom and dad, I tell them they've learned more Torah in the last two months, you know, because they're just always accessing so much. So at the, at the, at the click of a button, you can choose to be, um, to, to follow Rabbi Yossi Ben Kisma's advice, even if you're just by yourself at home. Um, and I, I wanted to, to put this out there. Um, that Rabbi Weiss also wrote about this time. He says, over and over, we've heard the call to socially distance ourselves from others. And yet, while on the surface, COVID-19 has physically separated us, in other ways, it has become the catalyst to socially connect us. Perhaps, as I've heard suggested, the term social distancing should be replaced with physical distancing. The virus has in many ways brought us socially closer than ever before. And um, I think this idea of connectedness, and this is what Hallowell is saying in this element, he says that connectedness is what leads to, um, to adult happiness. Remember these are all these, we're looking at three elements of childhood roots that lead to adult happiness. So if you have your child connected early, and if they feel connected to something bigger or other people or more of a community, then that leads to more happiness. And if you, if you think about it, I, I, I'm looking at the, the group here. A lot of us work with, with kids and families, people who feel that they're connected to more of a community. You know, we can, we can, define, we can work another day. We could talk about what happiness is. We could do Aristotle's happiness and and all that, and we did French. I think last year we did friendship, right, Psachia? I think we did we did Aristotle's friend a, a friendship yeah, last yeah, year, yeah. and that's not unlike this idea of being connected to other people. Um, and Rav Lau's commentary on this pure kavod, I just wanted to to point out because all of us choose different communities to which to connect ourselves. So he says on this commentary on Pirkeva, which is a beautiful commentary, he says the answer with this idea of when should you move or when should you decide to move communities, he says that the decision depends on the place, the period, and the person. Every person has to know himself, his abilities, and limitations, the nature of his place, and the place to which he is told to uproot from. Everyone has to be judged on his own. And all of us, all of us have moved communities at times and have sometimes decided to be part of bigger communities or smaller communities. And um, those are very, very difficult, difficult um, decisions to make. But this idea of connectedness, we had play and connectedness. Connectedness leads to more of a feeling of purpose. And I look at, um, and I look at, uh, you know, I know that uh, Judy's daughters, we're, we're all connected to the Pearlstone family. And I'll uh, just put a little plug because I'm sure I'll be embarrassed. But what David uh, led in Israel, as far as showing what connectedness to the community can be at this time, 
I think you has arranged for over 400 meals, maybe even more at this point, right, David? Delivered, delivered, yeah. to, delivered to people. We're seeing people who are feeling connected step up at this time, which is like unbelievable. Thank Any you. Any thoughts? Any thoughts on this connectedness? Okay. Further, should we go for the last one? Oh, sure. Okay, optimism, a great one. There's a beautiful poem on optimism. Psaki, will you read the poem on, opti on optimism? I can't hear you, I'm gonna unmute you. Oh, uh, yeah, Optimism by Jane Hirschfield. More and more I have come to admire resilience, not the simple resistance of a pillow whose foam returns over and over to the same shape, but the sinuous tenacity of a tree. Finding the light newly blocked on one side, it turns in another, a blind intelligence true. But out of such persistence arose turtles, rivers, mitochondria, figs, all this resinous, unretractable earth. Take that one in. I'm gonna put it on I'm gonna put it on its own page so you can see the whole thing. Hold on. This idea is so resonant now that resilient we we're always looking at we're never we're never gonna go back to the world that existed before this challenge in our lives. We're never going to. So what does it really mean? And I didn't even think of this, what and this is why I love learning with you guys so much, is that like now I'm thinking of it in a totally different light. What does it really mean when someone says I'm optimistic about this? We're hearing that on the news, we'll be better. I'm optimistic, we're gonna come out better. We're not gonna ever be like the, the resistance of the pillow whose foam returns over and over to the same shape. We're never going to spring back to where we were before. But what, what is the optimist going to do? I we're gonna be like the tree. Right, Psachia? We're gonna find the light newly blocked on one side, and it's gonna we're gonna turn to another side. And we're gonna be persistent in our optimism. And that's what's going to lead to new things. And I think that that's such an important thing. Look at Hallowell says, uh, and by the way, there's a lot of a lot written, and I'm sure Judy can, can enlighten us, because there are a lot, a lot of studies are done on hope and optimism and what that means. We're not going to split the optimism hope hairs today. We're going to sort of put them together. That'll be for another time. But look what Hallowell says. Research has demonstrated that optimism is one of the strongest predictors of adult happiness. It takes much more courage and creativity to maintain an optimistic stance than to wilt into pessimism and cynicism. Optimism does not refer to a silly or blind denial of the negative aspects of life but rather to the practice of finding solutions to problems in a tendency to believe that there is always realistic hope, no matter how bad things get. So this idea, another one of these roots of adult happiness is, you know, I spend a lot of time, I know everyone's gonna be jealous when I say this, I spend a lot of time with Miller's middle schoolers. <laughs> and, um, you know, Middle schoolers are, um, I, 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 you know, I've spent the most time with middle schoolers in the last four years than I had most of my professional life. And middle schoolers um, are, are just getting that spark of, are they going to be sort of, um, you know, neg negative negativity or if they're going to embrace positivity. And I always talk to them about being positive and pot and and I always in many ways go overboard to tell them to be positive and optimistic. And this idea of um, optimism doesn't mean a blind denial of negativity. And you know, Sakya was telling me that um, and, and all of us know of people um, who who have been lost to this 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 tragic chapter of our lives. And 
being optimistic doesn't mean that we're denying the the tragedy of it or the or the price the emotional um and tragic price that this is paying we have to find a way to find that there can be a light we will find a way to to sort of lean in to some other kind of light and um I'm going to take it to the end here and then we'll get some comments. Um, this is, these are two pieces. One is by Rabbi Sachs and one is um, about the Seder. Rabbi Sachs says, optimism is the belief that things are going to get better. Hope is the belief. And again, I don't want to split hairs on the hope and optimism. We're going to, for today, we'll make them the same. Oh. Hope is the belief that we can make things better. Optimism is passive. Hope is active. It takes no courage to be an optimist, but it does need courage to be hope. And, you know, in Hallowell, I think he's using optimism as the same way as hope, that we need to be courageous and be hopeful. Um, and it's really hard. I mean, and I think that all of us need each other. And I'm, I'm, I'm also just like thanking all of you for joining this because it's, it's giving me more optimism just by talking it through. Um, that. Um, there's going to be a light after this. No one knows what that light is going to look like. And um, you know, we said at the end of at the end of um, at the end of the seder, we say every year we say Lashana haba Yerushalayim. And um, I think I, I think my wife wrote on her Facebook post that it's not Lashana haba Yerushalayim. It'll be Lashana haba at Pearlstone. At, at least we hope we're some we're we're at. I hope I'm not in my office next to Lashana haba. That's definitely my hope. But um, Rabbi Weiss, at, his, at the end of, his, um, of this piece on the coronavirus, said, my parents would always end the Seder by singing Hatikva as an expression that the redemption, especially with the establishment of the state of Israel, is already upon us. The words ring powerfully these days. We will forever be hopeful. We will overcome. Yes, with patience, trust, and will, we will make it. Patience, no longer how long it takes. Trust in God, in our healers, in our personal resolve. As the rabbis say, Ein davar Nothing stands in the way of the will. On this Pesach too, we pray that we begin the journey from twilight to dawn, from darkness to light. Lu yehi, if only. So this idea that optimism is... Think of the people in your life who are making a difference in the world or in your family, those are the people I would, I would challenge to say are the ones who are the most optimistic. The people who, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to screen share so I can see everybody now. Um, the, the people who are not um, pie in the sky optimists, but are working towards saying that we're going to embrace light through this. And um, I think that those people, and I think of um, people that I know that I knew when they were really younger, and um, of that, there's really only one person on this group, my old friend David, but who always said that, you know, we can roll up our sleeves and do, and we can be positive and be optimistic, especially in this time. I mean, I, all of us, um, it is easy to be pessimistic in this. And the question is, um, you know, it's okay to be sad and frustrated. It, you know, it's, it's our human nature to sometimes maybe complain a little about the situation. But in the end, that re the, the idea of being like the tree to bend to the light, um, I really want to bless us all with as we, um, as, we, as we move forward in this. And so, again, this idea of playfulness, play a little bit. It's good to have a little fun and realize that the playfulness is what, what can lead to creativity and, 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 and newness. And that's part of our avodat Hashem, our service of God that leads to, to successful adulthood. Connectedness, very important, especially at this time, to stay connected. It leads and it feeds our happiness. And third, this idea of optimism, because optimism is going to lead us all um, hopefully, out of this, 
into a new chapter of goodness and hope. And so I want to wish everyone a huge Chag Sameach. Um, I want to thank Sachia and, the, and my friends and my family of Pearlstone who um, continue. I got to tell you, I walked in here and I said to myself, like, really? I, I have to be honest with you. I was like, you know, if I can't be with the field and the goats and my people, I'm not going to get that feeling. But you know what? Being on this and learning together has given me that. So I thank all of you for joining this. Um, I say hello to Jill. I don't, I see someone on, on Zoom. Um, and um, I just wish you goodness and health and, uh, and a peaceful hug. Any thoughts, anything that people want to add? Judy, some thoughts? Yes, well, you know, it's, it's very interesting because many of the school systems are beginning to teach social emotional learning. And um, the federal government has actually come up with a huge survey that measures it and its relationship to student achievement. So this notion of, of playfulness, of connectedness, of being a part of something important is really germane to kids in learning math and learning English and learning everything they have to know because as they feel a part of their school and their system and their group and their class, um, it all has great impact on what in fact they, they learn academically. So it's, it, it all ties together here. And so, yes, Thank you. It's a, it's a great book, highly recommended. Okay. Um, I Aaron. Think, yes. No, I just wanted to, uh, sorry, I, I haven't been uh, taking all your beats to uh, participate, but I just wanted, <laughs> I just want to say one thing. Hi, everybody. I, I was only a Pearlstone once in my life, many, many years ago. I live in Israel. I'm in Wotian right now. Um, I'm an old friend of Aaron. So when I saw that this opportunity, um, uh, I never got to hear him speak. And so this was uh, actually a treat for me. Um, but I just wanted to say something about optimism. Um, first of all, I, I like that piece by Rabbi Weiss. I, as a very uh, small child, we always ended um, the Seder with Hatikva also. Um, we still do t that till this day. Um, but um, I think that I, um, when, when you talk about optimism, and certainly during the time of Svirat Omer, I think that you have to look to Rabbi Akiva, right? Because I think he was a primary um, example of optimism in, in Judaism. Uh, there are many stories, but the story of him, you know, walking on the Temple Mount and all the rabbis are crying and he's laughing, right? I mean, how could you be more optimistic than that? And I just want to show you, um, do you mind if I share my screen for a second, Aaron? Go ahead. Okay, so um, hold on one sec. I don't know how to do this. Oh, yeah, hold you on. have to let him share. Oh, oh I sorry. Can, I can let you share, David. Hold on. Okay, hold on. Go ahead. Okay, wait one Fair second. Enough. Okay. Uh, uh, no, I can't. Anyway, um, I don't know why I can't. But um, anyway, I just wanted to point out this article um, that is called um, Rabbi Akiva's Optimism by Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik. Um, I'm actually um, I'm actually looking at it on the uh, Ishatora Ish uh website. It was written by on uh, November 10, 2007, by Rabbi Meir How the Jewish people managed to persevere throughout the arduous centuries of exile. It's a very excellent um, article about Rabbi Akiva's optimism. And can you put um, it on the chat, David, can you can you put the yeah, link? Yeah, up yeah, yeah, that? yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. It's worth reading, and especially during these days where we're in Spirata Omer during this exact time where Rabbi Akiva is right. the primary, uh, I think it's important to recognize that. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Tov. Hold on. Um, thank you There's so much. For um, I also wanted thank to you, share that um, Aaron will be giving more shiurim. Uh, in uh, this week of, uh, in Pesach online, and Laura uh, um, Frank is going to be giving a shear um, in um, what is it uh, forty minutes at three o'clock, and all of these uh, Pesach at Pearlstone online classes are recorded, and you can go to uh, PearlstoneCenter.org/slash/online. Um, and um, and and the Facebook page to be able to see them. And if you're watching this um, through the Facebook page, we'll try to post 
the um, uh, handout sources uh, in a link. And thank you so much again. Thank you, everybody. This was so delightful. And um, maybe I'll see you Tuesday. Stay healthy. Okay, you as well. All the best. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Thank everybody. Thanks for joining. Mm -hmm.